thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Scott Sauer. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I've done a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery. So that's really my primary focus is, is foot and ankle. And I, I cover all treatment options of the foot and ankle, conservative, surgical, and really focus on uh, individual treatments uh, tailored to your specific needs. Tonight I thought it was an important uh, topic to talk about um, ankle arthritis. I think it's something that we have that's pretty prevalent in society that people don't really know a lot about, they don't know what to do, and uh, I'm hope, I hope uh, with this discussion to, to give you some ideas about what arthritis is in general. Um, I'll show you some drawings and pictures that kind of demonstrate what arthritis is. And then um, some of the treatment options for ankle arthritis particularly, since that's an area of my focus, that we can um, um, discuss and show you some pictures and I can tell you about that. Um, with me tonight is Mark Llewellyn. He's a physical therapist that I work closely with. Um, he has a particular interest in foot and ankle and uh, we work together on a lot of patients and he's going to provide the therapy perspective which is going to be a conservative treatment option which I think is important prior to any kind of surgical intervention and then um, post-operatively um, physical therapy is definitely an important aspect to uh, doing any if there's any kind of surgery done. So um, we'll start off with our, our first slide here. Exactly what is arthritis? Arthritis is uh, inflammation of the joint. It's uh, der derived from the Latin um, arthros, which is, means joint, and then itis, which is any type of inflammation. Um, it's one of, the lead most, uh, one of the leading causes of disability in the United States. It, uh, there are several different types, which we'll cover just a, a few of those things, um, just so you can, can be educated on that. And then um, basically any type of arthritis can lead to a destruction of the cartilage and that's the underlying problem with arthritis in any joint. Um, these are some pictures of what arthritis is. So on the left side is a normal appearing um, joint where the nice white articular cartilage which is that slippery substance that you might see on the end of bones like if you look at the end of a chicken bone you'll see this white and glistening cartilage that is um, what cartilage is it helps um, the joint move more fluidly and then underneath the that cartilage is the lining of the bone which is called periosteum and then the bone underneath um, which, which appears normal on the left. And then when you look to the right, that picture is uh, significantly different where there's no cartilage, there's a lot of cystic changes, as well as um, the bone has sort of eroded down, uh, which is common with severe arthritis. So in this, um, in this picture, this is a little bit different where there's more, um, th it's a similar I image where the normal side has normal cartilage, there's normal joint surrounding it and normal bone, but on the right side there's significant change, okay? And that's because the cartilage has worn down. The joint fluid which is inside the joint can get pushed into the bone and it, it forms these little cysts and sometimes on x-rays, and we're going to see some of the x-rays, sometimes that appears like a little hole in the bone, okay? And it just provides this raggedy, roughened surface that really doesn't move very fluidly, okay? Go ahead. And so what happens in arthritis? I mean, on the, again, the same side, normal side there on your left has a normal cartilage cap where the white cartilage is and then the bones and in the ankle joint there are three bones there's the tibia the fibula and the talus bone and that's really the part that makes your ankle go up and down the ends of the bones are covered in white cartilage and that's what provides the surface the glide and makes the joint move nice and smooth well now if you look at the right side the cartilage has been cracked and broken there's it's wearing down and there's really not a good cartilage surface that allows the joint to move nicely and this is really what an arthritic ankle joint looks like. In terms of pain, I mean the typical symptoms for arthritis of the ankle are pain, stiffness, swelling. So what causes the pain? Usually it's because of this damaged and flaking cartilage that can cause the um, ankle to become painful. All right? the, the cartilage and the, the pieces that break off can float around and damage the joint. Um, the ankle can feel unstable and because that, that pieces, the pieces that are floating around, 
they can actually get stuck in the joint and it's, it's kind of like a pebble in a gear. It gets stuck, your ankle may lock and, and cause pain that way. The bone and the, there's bone on bone contact. What does that mean? When the cartilage wears away, there's bone left underneath and that bone on bone is very sensitive and it rubs and grinds. It's almost like sandpaper rubbing together. You can have sw swelling and stiffness. There's also the ligaments that can be looser. Sometimes they're tighter or looser and you can, f you can have an unstable feeling. Um, bone spurs and extra bones around the joint is basically the body's response to that arthritis and inflammation. It's forming more bone to provide more surface area for the joint to move so you get spurs that's a result of inflammation. That can also cause pain as well. Go ahead. What are the types of ankle arthritis? These are just a few, but the main ones. Osteoarthritis, that's your typical wear and tear arthritis. Just from it being active your entire life, you, it's a slow progression. The cartilage loss is very slow over time, and it really doesn't have to do with an injury. Sometimes it can, it can um, occur just primarily from that active lifestyle wear and tear. Um, other arthritis include rheumatoid and post-traumatic. So rheumatoid arthritis is a little different. That's when you have your body and its immune system is actually attacking the joint. It, it looks at the, the lining of the joint as a foreign um, thing inside your body and it reacts to it. You get inflammation inside the joint, it causes pain, inflammation, and swelling, and, and that can affect any joint in the body. Okay? And that's often um, something that's treated with medicines to try to suppress the immune system in an effort to kind of keep it from attacking your joints, keep it from getting painful. And then the post-traumatic arthritis can lead to osteoarthritis. It's more of a secondary phenomenon, but what happens is you have an injury. It could be a sprain, could be a fracture that's severe from trauma or even just stepping off the curb wrong, that alters the mechanics in the joint. And over time, because of that altered angle or a deformity that occurs, you can have the development of an, of an arthritis from that where the joint wears away over time. Okay. So these are some x-rays that you can see. Uh, again, on your left is a normal x-ray. Um, that's the tibia above. And if you remember the picture from a few slides ago, they are all the same same bones, tibia above, fibula all the way to the outside, and then the talus bone underneath. And if you look, there's a nice space here between all the bones, and that's where the cartilage is. You can't see cartilage on x-ray, it's basically just bone, and that's what you see on an x-ray, it's a 2D picture. Um, in mild arthritis, which is here, you start to see a little narrowing here, okay? There's narrowing, there's a little spur formation, and, but in general, the cartilage is intact, okay? Go ahead. On these other severe, moderate, and severe arthritis pictures, you're going to see a totally different picture now. So on the left, more moderate, there's pretty severe narrowing here, okay, some little spurs that are formed. And then this is severe arthritis where you have bone on bone, so there's no space anymore. And there's even these little circles here that are black dots and they look like, those are cysts, okay? So that's what they look like on x-ray. Just there's a space there that the x-ray beam, you know, gets through a lot easier. So it's a, 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 a cystic formation that occurs because the fluid kind of gets pushed into the bone. It's forced in there because there's no space left anymore. It's pretty unusual to get MRIs on, uh, on late arthritis because it's severe bone on bone and you can often see it on x-ray, but sometimes in the earlier stages an MRI is helpful because you can see localized areas of arthritis. So in this case you can see little areas in the bone that are not flat. All right? There's a little, little valley there, something like, almost like a pothole in the road, that's how I describe it. Um, there's a hole there that's formed from either trauma or over time it's worn away. It really is helpful to get an MRI in the early stages if you're not sure it's, a, it's purely arthritic and fen uh, an arthritic phenomenon, but in, in most cases you can see it on x-ray. So what are our treatment goals with arthritis in the ankle? I mean, we want to relieve pain and inflammation. We also want to slow the d disease progression. Unfortunately, we haven't figured out a way to cure arthritis yet, but we want to prevent it from getting worse if possible, and we want to control the symptoms from it. And that really comes down to, after doing that, you're improving a quality of life, as well as improving or maintaining some kind of functional independence. 
treatment options really vary. So we're going to talk about conservative treatment options. Those are no non-surgical treatment options. And we're going to exhaust all those before we talk about surgical options, OK? So the conservative treatment options include medications, lifestyle changes, physical therapy, bracing. Those are things that don't involve any type of um, surgical intervention, OK? And then when those things don't work, we consider doing surgery. Medications that you've all heard of and talked about, pain relievers like tramadol, opioids, those are like the narcotic medications like Percocet, Vicodin. Um, those, those are pretty strong pain pills that we reserve for the most severe cases of pain, maybe a flare-up that really you're having trouble sleeping, things like that. I mean, we try to use those judiciously though. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, naproxen, Aleve, all these things are the non-selective type. Those are the types that can affect your stomach a little bit more. They, don't, they, they, don't, they inhibit all the enzymes that affect inflammation in your body, and that includes the protective enzymes of, for your stomach. So we use those as a first line of defense, but if it's something that we might want to consider using more long term, then we're going to go to maybe a more selective medication like um, those are the Celebrexes or the Mobix that sometimes they only inhibit the certain enzymes that affect inflammation as opposed to like the stomach ones. So a little bit better on the stomach, um, but they do have their risks, there's no question, and we talk about all those things. Um, the other medications like nutritional supplements and joint injections, the nutritional supplements that are used are like the glucosamine, chondroitin sulfates, those are the ones that are most studied. Those basically are, the, um, are nutritional for the cartilage in the joint. So they really go to every joint. They basically supersede saturate the body with a, um, with a nutrient for the cartilage and they get into the joint through the bloodstream and it provides the cartilage with better nutrients. Um, something that you probably get enough of in your diet but some of the, in some studies it's shown to be beneficial over longer periods of time to preserve cartilage. The other supplements like fish oil and vitamin E really haven't been studied in depth although there are some that believe they have an anti-inflammatory effect. So, and they're often taken for other reasons anyway, so they found sort of that on, on that, that level. Um, the joint injections, pretty common to do cortisone in any arthritic joint, and now you're putting the anti-inflammatory drug right into the joint. Instead of having it pass through your body, your GI system, into the blood, you're putting it directly in there, and it bathes the inflamed surfaces and reduces inflammation over time. And it's, it's much more um, beneficial in earlier arthritis because there's, you already have a lot of cartilage there. When it's bone on bone, sometimes that can, it, it's not as effective, okay? And then we discuss um, hyaluronic acid. So these, I like to call them the joint jelly injections. Basically the things like Simvisc, Supar, Tialgan, I mean there are many other ones, Uflexa, Orthovix, all that. A they're basically, you're, now you're replenishing the joint fluid, the, the synovial fluid, and that's, this is the main component, hyaluronic acid. And, and it's only FDA approved for the knee at this point, but it's, I found beneficial using it off-label in the ankle because it's basically the same type of joint. You're injecting the same medication. And it, it, in my hands, I, I get about a 60% relief with some of the arthritis, depending on how severe it is. People seem to do pretty well, and there are some studies that support it. So we, we work with, with you on that and decide if that's the best option for you. Um, Platelet-rich plasma sort of has, uh, it's, it's in its early stages of being used. It's not often covered by insurance. They basically draw the blood out of your body and they spin it down to a good uh, concentrated solution that they then you would inject into the affected joint. It's used for other things like tennis elbow, um, tendonitis in the foot and the ankle. And it has, uh, I think, has a, has a limited role only because insurance doesn't really cover it and sometimes you're paying out of pocket to get it done. Um, and there are, a lot, there are some facilities that don't even offer it, which really at this point isn't, it's not unusual just because of the cost involved. So the, the data is still being uh, developed for that particular therapy and, and it's sort of a, something to look to in the future. So this is just an example and a picture of what like an ankle joint injection would look like. Um, this is basically putting the needle around the area. It's really, I mean, I think if you're really inflamed and sore, it's probably one of the better options just because you're going to get in, not instant relief, but it's pretty quick over time.
So another conservative cho choice is lifestyle change. That's something that most people do before they come into the office. They've stopped walking for longer periods of time or they've altered the way they do um, you know, their normal athletic activities. Um, basically avoiding any kind of impact activity which you know can mean a walk it could mean you know going up and down stairs if that's what they need to do which sometimes in terms of normal daily activities isn't acceptable but most of the time running aerobics treadmills um, those are things that they avoid as well non-impact exercise is often used um, something like swimming or biking, yoga, Pilates, those are things that don't involve a lot of impact on the joint but can be just as effective in terms of exercise. Um, using a, an assisted device like a cane or a walker um, is, is not unheard of. I mean typically that now you're taking the pressure off of that particular joint because in the ankle specifically it's about five times your body weight. So weight loss assisted device those are all things that we discuss I mean I'm certainly not a weight loss counselor but I do you know we do talk about that briefly it just makes sense from this you know physics standpoint you're gonna lose the mass on that area it's gonna feel better so I mean that's something that we always consider physical therapy I think is important you know in the conservative treatment options because if you have weakness around the ankle but also in the other areas of the leg knee hip area I mean that is all going to affect your ankle biomechanics and range of motion so we always consider that it's important to improve the motion of the ankle somehow stretching um, the ankle if the Achilles tendon is tight um, improving ankle strength is very important because that provides more stability not only in the ankle but for the upper part of the leg, the knee, the hip, things like that. Um, decreasing pain and swelling is important and there are a number of modalities that they can utilize in therapy that can, that if it's appropriate for you they can use things like ultrasound, um, electrical stim, um, there's iontophoresis which is actually putting steroids through the, transdermally through the skin which is done through a, a patch that's applied to the area so there are many ways to try to reduce pain and inflammation use, using that these particular modalities in the physical therapy office and Mark is going to touch on that obviously and many other things I assume <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about bracing I think bracing is an important option for for arthritis because it really um, it can limit or support the affected joint. So they do, we do it in knees, mostly ankles though because that can definitely give a lot of support around a, a smaller joint that takes a lot of pressure. Okay, So we talk about shoe wear modifications, um, things like inserts, rocker soles, cushioned heels, those are all things that can decrease the impact on the joint with walking. Um, Non-fixed supportive braces basically just mean a soft brace around the ankle that can give some support, some compression, maybe decrease the infl inflammation and swelling. Um, supportive braces that are fixed now have a little more rigidity to them. So that's something that you can do like a standard ankle brace that you maybe get for an ankle sprain that gives you a lot of support. I know they, you know, they have them at sporting goods stores, we have them in our office, we give them out commonly for sprains are one of the most you know, common orthopedic injuries. And then the, the more rigid braces or the circumferential braces maybe like a custom brace they actually have, would have your your foot molded and then a brace made for the ankle that would give it more support okay go ahead these are just an example of a couple non fixed supportive braces the cloth lace-up brace ASO type brace something that you could probably buy at a sporting goods store we I know we have them in our offices and then the plastic hinge brace is a very common brace used for ankle sprains but it also serves a secondary role in arthritis because it gives that lateral support or the support in the ankle to keep it from moving back and forth the next types of braces now these are a little bit more um, they're, they're more custom, they, they provide a lot more support than the other braces, and these are the fixed braces. So it's rare that I use this brace on, on the left here, it's, it's a molded ankle foot orthosis, basically a MAFO, that it, it limits or eliminates any ankle joint motion. So you can imagine if you have bone on bone and your ankle's you know, grinding away and moving, well, you want to eliminate that movement there, and this can help with that. I tend to use the brace on the right more, which is, the, which is called an Arizona brace, basically developed for this particular problem as well as others. Other arthritis in the foot, um, there are tendinopathies or tendon inflammations that can be treated with this, but it basically is custom made. It's mainly leather around these areas with the lace up, and then inside is a plastic 
mold around the ankle that really eliminates movement at the ankle joint. So these are two, um, well, mainly the, the Arizona, I think, is in my hands a better alternative because it's, it's, patients are more compliant with it. It's a little bit easier to wear than the other brace um, in this case. Shoe wear modifications like this. This is a cushioned heel above. It's all, you know, also called a satch heel. And then a, like a rocker bottom or a little wedge heel and a sneaker can help just to take the force off the joint when you land on your heel. And that can take, you know, take away some of the pain. Just a simple modification on a shoe like that. So we've talked a little bit about the conservative treatments. I think um, you know we try to exhaust as much of that as we can. Um, and I'll be honest with you: if, if your bone, if your ankle is really you know pretty severe, bone on bone, we're gonna we're gonna eliminate the ones that I, I don't think is gonna are gonna work. But you know there may be th some surgical considerations then if we get to a point where you're not comfortable. We've tried some things and we we're just not getting anywhere. So the surgical treatment options, I think, there are three, really. Arthroscopic debridement, there's arthrodesis, which is ankle fusion, and arthroplasty, which is joint replacement, okay? Ankle arthroscopy, I think, has its role in early stages of arthritis. This is where you have a lot of cartilage left. It's just maybe certain areas of it that have been damaged, and you have small little pockets that maybe are flaking and it's kind of like that pebble in a gear scenario if a piece of cartilage is floating around you can go in there arthroscopically and get it clean out the inflamed tissue and generally have a pretty good result from that um, it takes small incisions and there's you know a little camera you use no it's really no bigger than a pencil and you can do your work minimally invasive okay arthrodesis or fusion is really reserved for advanced arthritis now you're talking about close to bone on bone or just intractable pain that you're going to remove the ankle joint entirely by taking out the arthritic portion of it, put the bones directly adjacent to each other and hold them there with some type of fixation, screws, plate, something to put it, push it together, kind of like you're putting two pieces of wood together. And then over time the body takes over and it heals like it would heal a fracture, the bone grows together, now you have a fused joint. So that eliminates the movement in the joint and basically there's no joint to be inflamed anymore and the pain subsides substantially. And this is really the mainstay of treatment for severe arthritis in the ankle is a fusion. It's been done for years and years and it seems to be more, um, it's a more popular procedure just in terms of that, the outcomes are a little bit more predictable for that particular surgery. Now the, the recovery can be a little bit longer and we're going to talk about arthroplasty in the same sense but there, there's definitely a little bit more length to a fusion re surgery recovery. Arthroplasty or joint replacement is also reserved for advanced arthritis. Um, now you're cutting out the arthritic joint but you're not fusing it, you're actually putting now, you're resurfacing it basically and you're putting in a new tibial surface, a new tailor surface and then some plastic in between so you're really able to maintain a somewhat normal joint mo motion, okay, it's pretty important. Um, you, you're preserving the, the joint motion and one of the, the downsides in the past with these um, arthroplasties is the implant can loosen or even fail over time so there's going to be some um, complications that can occur with arthroplasty, with fusion, and we'll touch on all that. Arthroscopic debridement, I mean basically I just have a picture, the camera's going into the ankle joint, but you can see just how small those, those uh, cameras are. I mean they're pretty small, the ankle joint, the toes are going towards that side, and, and there are two small incisions to, to do that kind of surgery. This is some, what you would see inside the joint, and if you look at the tail, so that's the bottom bone, the, 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 the joint is really smooth. It's nice and white and glistening, kind of looks like a cue ball type effect. That's what normal cartilage should look like. Then the tibia above looks the same way. And there may be some synovitis. That's basically inflamed tissue inside the joint. That, that's common with any inflamed joint. This is what you'd see in early arthritis. Now I have a little grasper in there and I'm grabbing a piece of cartilage that's floating around. And then where that cartilage came from, is a little divot in that area. So you're looking, now I'm scooping out the bad scar tissue that's in there because I want that to fill in on its own. And the body will fill that in, it'll bleed, it'll form like a scar cartilage in that area that's not quite normal articular cartilage, which is the white glistening cartilage, but it's good enough for, for that area. It's such a small region. Even though it looks big on the picture, it's really only millimeters big. So that scar cartilage does the job it needs to do. So before we get to this slide, I mean that arthroscopic 
surgery, it's really reserved for the early stages because you really can't do a lot in advanced arthritis. There's not any cartilage left. You really are just debriding and maybe cleaning out some of the loose bodies that are there. But it's not really been shown to improve outcome, much like knee arthritis with arthroscopy. It's kind of the same thing. Ankle arthrodesis. So this is one, just a diagram or a picture of what an ar arthrodesis is. So if you remember the picture a few slides ago with the normal bony anatomy, with the tibia on top, the fibula outside on the right or on your left here, and then the talus below. And these, this is what happens. You, you cut out that, cut out this area, and then you fix it with either screws or a plate. There are many different types of, of products that you can put in to get it to stay together. And every surgeon that does a fusion has his own way, his or her own way of doing it. Um, either a screw or a plate. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. This is just an x-ray now. Remember the x-rays from before? Well, now we don't have a joint anymore. We have a lot of screws that go across it to fuse it together. And you can't see that nice line where the joint is anymore. It's been sort of, it's grown together into one bone. So uh, I think some important things to think about with a fusion and, and some misconceptions that you're going to have a limp, you know, you're not going to be able to walk normally. I, 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 have, I think that's a, sort of a misconception. I, the gait in an ankle fusion is generally normal. Um, you know, we're, as long as you have normality around the ankle itself with other um, joints that are normal appearing in the foot, in the bone, in the knee, um, in the, in the uh, heel bone, I think there's no reason to not expect a normal gait. And that, you know, really involves post-operative rehab and things like that. Um, that you may have a limp. I mean, I, I'm not 100%. I can't promise you that you wouldn't have one. But in general, some people you, would, you wouldn't even know have an ankle fusion that walk around. They look fairly normal walking. Um, the joints, like I said, above and below have to be normal. I mean, otherwise we have to focus on whether or not you have arthritis in the other joints around the ankle, and that can, that's, that can be common as well. Um, like, and because of this fusion, depending on when it's done in your life, you can develop further arthritis in these other joints long term. So when you immobilize a joint, the pressure and the forces go through that and into another joint. So when you fuse the ankle, the forces are going to go into the other joints and over time that may wear, wear them down. Okay, so that's why the, the arthroplasty or joint replacement has come about to try to preserve normal joint motion if possible. Fusion rates are very high, so it's a, it's a very successful surgery. Usually it takes about six to eight weeks for the fusion to occur. So you do have to wait and be off your foot for that long, which can be, you know, a long time. Um, residual discomfort is, can occur in some cases, but again, it really depends on the patient, how bad the arthritis is, and you know, what the results are from the surgery. Other complications that can occur are what's called malunion. That means that when you fuse the ankle, you fuse, it, it's fused in a, in a poor position. And that, that's pretty unusual, but it can happen. Sometimes the ankle settles um, with time as it's fusing. So it can be, you can imagine if your foot is pointed downward more, it's a little bit harder to walk. Non-union is also a risk that can occur, which means that the, even though you've done your best to fuse it together, it doesn't fuse. So for some reason, the body doesn't heal. That, that can happen in people that smoke, that have bad blood flow to their, their lower extremity, um, other medical problems. And those are things that you have to consider with that. And sometimes they can require another surgery. Go ahead. So that's why we, that they've developed the ankle replacement. So the ankle replacement that I use is called the STAR Total Ankle Replacement. It's the Scandinavian Total Ankle Replacement. It's basically a resurfacing. So we have the metal tibial component on the tibial side. We have the tailor component on the tailor side. And then in between, we have a plastic insert, which is very common in, in any joint replacement. And I have a model here that I'm going to pass around. And you can move it around and see how the ankle joint moves. This is really the only ankle replacement that is um, FDA approved for this particular uh, replacement type that has three components that allows these kind of movements, OK? So I'll pass that around if, you know, afterwards if you have questions about it's it in particular. Star. It's S-T-A-R, star. S -T -A -R, star. Okay. Yeah, it should be uh, in there too. Go ahead. And this is just the, uh, you know, the picture of the components themselves um, and not inserted in the body. Go ahead. These are x-rays of what it looks like in your body. Basically, you've removed the arthritic part. You're putting in the metal parts, which show up on x-ray really good. 
And then the plastic part that doesn't show up, but they put this little metal implant, it looks like a little, almost like a little wire in there. That's just so you know where the plastic insert is. So the, that insert really is like your replacement cartilage, and it slides and glides on the metal parts of it to keep you moving. So what are some concerns with ankle arthroplasty? The same with any surgery. You worry about incisions healing, and that's, you know, that can vary depending on the patients and if there are complicated medical issues, diabetes, and things like that. Infections can occur with all joint replacements, just like any surgery, but we always worry with joint replacements because we're putting in metal and plastic in somebody. That's, some, that's always a concern. So we give antibiotics before, give it after surgery, and depending on how things go, you might need a little bit more antibiotic if you did get an infection, but it's pretty unusual. Parts can wear out over time, and I think that's always a concern with any joint replacement. Fortunately, with the new designs on any of the total ankle systems, it's a pretty low wear rate. Now, depending on how they're inserted, you know, there's a lot of reasons that the parts can wear down. I think the data for the ankle replacements is much better than it has been in the past. It's certainly not anywhere near what a total knee or total hip is, but there are so many of those that have been implanted over, you know, tens and twenties years, even longer than that, 50 years, that the, the ankle replacement in, in terms of these particular models, the STAR uh, being one of them, I think has a good track record uh, so far. So this is going to be a little bit hard to read because of the screen size, but this just sort of compares the two ankle replacement versus the ankle fusion. And I wanted to just point out that both are good surgeries, both are indicated for ankle arthritis. It really just depends on the patient and how we decide. They, the, the, the advantage of the joint replacement is that it allows motion to occur. The, the fusion locks the ankle joint at a fixed position. Um, they both provide pretty predictable relief of pain because you're eliminating the arthritic ankle joint. Okay, And you can correct significant deformities in the ankle. So not everybody has a perfectly aligned ankle joint. You have to work around what's there, and in, in cases of both the uh, replacement as well as the fusion, you can, you can work around the deformity. Okay? Um, the advantage with the joint replacement is that you can bear weight a lot faster. So whereas you might wait two weeks after the joint replacement to put any weight on the ankle, um, the fusion you would have to wait at least four to six weeks, probably more like the six week range because it takes longer for the body to heal the bone together than the ankle replacement to set in. Um, revision rate at five years is pretty low. That just means that some people, and small percentage of them, would need another surgery on the ankle replacement because for whatever reason it's either, f it, it can loosen, just like any joint replacement, it can wear a little bit faster, so you'd have to revise it. But that's a pretty low percentage rate compared to uh, a little bit higher non-union rate in the ankle fusion surgery. So you have complications that can occur. They're pretty low percentage, but Again, that's something to consider. Um, the the uh, star, the ankle replacement, can re re require a device replacement if that does wear out. Um, it's pretty unusual, and the and the fusion can re can um, result in arthritis in other joints. Again, that's over many years, so I don't look at those as really bad issues. But it's just something that can happen. Go ahead. There are, you know, a lot of the orthopedic societies have um, supported the ankle replacements now because, it, whereas before they were looked at more as experimental, I think now that they're a little bit, they're not quite mainstream, but they're, you know, reserved for most people that do foot and ankle surgery. So, and, you know, the Orthopedic Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, Academy, the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, I think um, it's becoming more accepted. Um, it's a good option. So basically these societies have accepted it. It's utilized in most of the uh, orthopedic hospitals that are ranked the best in at this US, the US News and World Report. And I think in terms of the STAR itself, um, it's becoming a, a, a total, the total ankle replacement of choice. Um, and you can see that in that last little graph there in 2011, I mean there, there are significantly more trained surgeons doing it. Insurance coverage had been, a, had been a problem in the past, but now it's not. Basically, that's what this slide says. Um, before, you know, because of its status, it hadn't really been covered by uh, insurance, and it hadn't been done a lot. But now, since it's become FDA approved in 2009, in particular the STAR implant, now we're dealing with um, 
pretty good coverage, so it's not really a concern anymore. So in summary, I mean, there are several types of ankle arthritis. We've touched on a few types, but I think the important ones when it comes, the mo probably the more common ones. Um, it's painful but treatable, and we've talked a lot about conservative and surgical treatments. Um, there's a variety of treatment options. I think really it, it comes down to an inv individual approach. Um, not everybody here has the same type of ankle arthritis if they even have it. It's, it's basically you have to see what you have, you have to see how severe it is, and then you go from there. Um, it's important to talk to your doctor, your family doctor, or you know, your orthopedic surgeon if that's a condition that you have that can be easily diagnosed. And then I think you have to be careful about some of the things you read. You go online, look on the internet. You just have to be careful with some of that. Um, use some you know, better websites. Certainly talking with your doctor about it I think is important. I think that's it. So I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, we can uh, talk about it now. I know Mark has some thoughts that he's prepared to talk about therapy considerations. And then we can talk more on an individual basis if you'd like and just go from there. Sure. <coughs> Doctor, are you talking about, whatever we're seeing, we're talking about uh, various kinds of arthritis, including rheumatoid arthritis. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm told that rheumatoid arthritis is a little, it's a little worse. Uh, as far as pain and uh, possibly some crippling, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the, other, uh, um, the other word that jumps out at me all the time is diffusion. And um, it appears to me when you fuse something, that's place, that's already, that's fused in place. You have to lose some motion. Absolutely. Yeah. So your first question, uh, arthritis types. I mean, rheumatoid arthritis, I think it's, it's definitely a... Um, a problem in terms of any type of arthritis. It's hard to rank what is better and worse um, if, if rheumatoid is worse than osteoarthritis because I think you know it's rare to have both conditions at the same time but oftentimes rheumatoid arthritis because it can affect the entire joint it's the body attacking the joint and it could affect any joint in your body it can definitely look a lot worse than it than you know just a normal osteoarthritis because you could be catching the osteoarthritis early Maybe there's just a little area that's worn away. But if you have osteoarthritis that's basically bone on bone, it could, it could be equal in intensity compared to the rheumatoid. So that's just, you know, just from basically looking at a lot of that, you can see both rheumatoid and osteo can be just as bad. It's just they're two different things to treat. That's why it's hard to treat either one of them. Um, and the fusion, absolutely, you're fusing the joint. So there's no movement, there's no joint left. You're fusing it in one position, a functional position, so that you know it's not moving and it doesn't hurt anymore. So that's yeah, that's I think where the the disadvantage is compared to the arthroplasty because the the, the replacement now is sort of allowing a relatively normal movement, although it's not going to be the same motion you had, you know, before you got ankle arthritis, and that disperses your forces differently in the joints around it, so it may not be as bad to those joints. Thanks everybody, my, my name is Mark. Um, I'm one of the uh, PTs at Coordinated Health, and as Dr. Sauer mentioned earlier, I work uh, very closely with him. And um, I guess uh, I can start as a, of a dovetail of one of your questions, sir, and um, you had mentioned the question to Dr. Sauer about the fusion. And I think if you talk to somebody who had really severe ankle pain and arthritis that affected the quality of their life and their daily living and the way that they moved and couldn't move, and when they opted to get a fusion, and I've seen these patients post-operatively, and they don't have that pain anymore, and we're working on um, moving the joints that can move, restoring um, the strength in the limb and the foot and ankle and improving their gait, and sometimes making shoe modifications to help smooth out their gait. They're, they're quite happy. So again, if you, if you know anyone who, who has been down that road, they'll, they sometimes will, will take the, you know, the fusion. So it, sometimes it, um, it can be a very positive thing. From a rehab standpoint, um, the way, the way I, I look at things, uh, again, as Dr. Sauer mentioned, it's a very, ta it, I try to tailor things. It's individualized. Knowing the, the type, um, how, how the joint, um, is the arthritis mild, moderate, or severe? Um, what is the person's lifestyle? Uh, how are, um, what's the impact on their life right now? And, um, and then looking at, um, you know, how the joints move or don't move. 
uh, what muscles are weak from the foot and ankle all the way through the across the knee and through the hip because those can affect how the foot uh, works and and then um, and then also uh, so then what, when we address these things we want to look at how can we make some of these things better to improve the overall function of the foot and ankle um, we can use uh, first to address things like um, the pain and inflammation we can use Things like ultrasound, heat, ice, um, tens units for home to address pain. We can uh, we can uh, we can get those for patients who have pretty constant pain. Um, so there's all there's all kinds of things we can do there. One thing um, I think is very important is to talk about um, setting limits. If you have uh, m more of a moderate or severe arthritis, or or you have a lot of pain and inflammation that affects the quality of your of your daily movement, and you're somebody that likes to do a lot of things, well. You know, sometimes I have a little sit down with patients and, and help them plan and set limits for their days and maybe not to exhaust all, you know, their movements and because uh, once the pain and swelling starts, then the rest of the day is shot. They're, you know, you're not feeling well, you're miserable, you have to deal with it for the next few days. And uh, so kind of sitting down and having a little planning session. You know, what needs to be done in a day? What activities do you have to do? What can you get help to do? How many times do you have to climb the stairs in a day? Some of this sounds very commonsensical, but some people don't really evaluate that when they're looking at how um, an arthritic condition can affect their life. Um, and another important thing I always talk about is footwear. Uh, I think I see w through the treatment of lots of foot and ankle conditions a lot of poor footwear and um, that has a really large impact on, on how your foot and ankle moves and, and, and again on other joints in your body. Um, when Dr. Sauer was talking about bracing and orthotics, a lot of those you know, work very well but they also need to be put into very good shoes. So there's, there's, we have wonderful places here in the, in, in the Lehigh Valley like Aardvark like Seidel's, like Foot Solutions there, where there's people there who can help you with whether you want a walking shoe or more of an orthopedic shoe um, or a running shoe. And these are things that, that really I, I talk a lot about with patients because I, I think people try to wear their shoes a little bit too long. Um, and, and if they do, and sometimes they have good shoes, but they're just maybe a poor selection for them and without even knowing it. Um, when um, when we talk about strategies for, for exercises, um, thinking, uh, instructing patients on basic things they can do to stretch, to maintain range of motion, little things you can do in the morning to get your ankles moving so those first few steps aren't so cranky. Um, or if you've been sitting watching a movie or in a long car ride, these are all the things I hear from patients and little things you can teach them to try to help, help them move better, you know, uh, making those first few steps not so bad. Uh, we address um, looking at the strength. There's a lot of muscles around the foot and ankle, uh, muscles around the knee, muscles around the hip. I assess all those and those have an impact on, on the leg, on your gait, on how you stabilize your pelvis and your trunk, which when those aren't stabilized well can actually impact how your foot strikes the ground during your walking cycle. So sometimes working on things away from the foot and ankle can have positive effects on offloading an arthritic joint. Uh, because when the joint is arthri arthritic, we want to do, um, we want to spare the joint as much as possible. So th that's, really, that's really what we do in therapy.